far. She riseth up also while it is yet night, and giveth meat unto her household, and a portion to her maids. She considereth a field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. Sounds like she's the manager of the household. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth out not by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands holdeth the distaff. She stretched out her hands to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles to the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing for she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou exceedest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. The verbiage may be from long ago and in some ways be a little unfamiliar to us, but if we look at the tasks that she undertook to take care of her household and her family, we see that mothers of today are very much the same. like to thank the Martins family and artists for that uh, beautiful music. And uh, 
Today, I don't know if you know, but it's the 110th anniversary of Mother's Day. A woman by the name of Anna Jarvis started this tradition of honoring our mothers in West Virginia 110 years ago today. So it's a happy Mother's Day. It may seem rather obvious to you that none of us would be here if it weren't for our mothers. However, if we look beyond the physical, I would ask the question, how many of us would be here if it weren't for our mothers? It was at our mother's feet that most of us learned the message of Jesus and saw a living example of love. If we go way back in the scriptures, back into the Old Testament, we remember that Moses received the Ten Commandments. Most of those commandments are thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But there's one in there that certainly isn't. It is honor your father and mother. Why? That your days may be long in the land. And so even far back, we were commanded to uh, honor our parents. And today we are honoring uh, our mothers. And for many of us, our mothers are no longer with us, but we certainly uh, do remember them. Uh, Jesus also honored his mother. You remember uh, the wedding at Cana where he asked his mother, what shall I do for you? And so we see that in even that area, Christ set the example for us. Motherly love is a God-given gift that we see throughout nature. You can look at animals and birds and see the love and concern for the offspring expressed. With the birds and the animals, this instinct in most instances ends when the juvenile reaches maturity. In humans, because of our God-given intelligence and emotions, this love continues throughout a lifetime and even beyond. Mothers demand little and give much. When the woman is pregnant, she physically gives of her body to the developing child. When the child is born, it comes into the world helpless. That's when mom takes over and begins a long process. The child has to be taught everything. They are a blank slate and what mom teaches them has a tremendous influence throughout their lives. And we know from Proverbs 22 and six, train up in a child that the way that he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. As we look around us in society, we see the many ills that afflict us. I will not go into detail, but crime, abuse, drug abuse, and immorality are rampant. Today, more than ever, we need strong Christian mothers to raise their children and teach them the truths that are found within the gospel of Jesus Christ. In many ways, they're the greatest religious teachers. We may take a child to church, or go to a camp or reunion, but the exposure to the gospel there is only a fraction of what it can be at home. Who does the young child trust most? His parents, especially mom. Many times, I'm sorry, many times their faith, dedication, and sensitivity exceeds that of the men. Certainly, in my case, I know it does. A couple of examples may serve to illustrate this. After the crucifixion, what happened? The disciples hid. The women went to the tomb. They were the last at the cross and the first at the resurrection. What happened to the men? Well, they went fishing. When Pharaoh was going to kill all the young children, was it Moses' mother or father who built the ark and placed the baby in it? It was the mother. A look back at my own life, I remember my mother teaching me about Jesus. I received one of the greatest gifts that a person could ever have. I was born into a family that loved Jesus and dedicated their lives to his service. My parents dreamed of and longed for Zion. For a couple minutes, I'd like to reminisce about my mother, a godly woman. Many of you knew her before she passed in 2008. My memory of my early childhood is not very good, but if I think back to one of the earliest memories I have, it would be when I was oh, probably five or six years old. 
My father was a contractor at the time and he had built a house for us in Covina, California. I was out in the yard with mom and she was sitting on the ground on an old seat cushion weeding. She was pulling the weeds out by hand and they were shaped like small evergreen trees and were maybe about a foot tall. And there were lots of them. I asked, why didn't, hadn't we seen dad for several days? She said he had gone to Independence to the church headquarters to help with some construction projects. For a short period of time, my father was under appointment. It's funny how our minds work. There is no earthly reason why I should remember this event, which really had nothing special about it. At the time, we lived in Los, the Los Angeles stake, and this was back in the 1950s when the RLDS church was doing well. The church had a beautiful reunion grounds, Camp Buckhorn in the mountains east of Los Angeles above Palm Springs. Thus, I had the opportunity to attend children's camps. When I returned from one camp, and I was very young at the time, mom was so appreciative that the camp staff had taken such good care of me. They had even washed my clothes and put them back in my suitcase, or so mother thought. Actually, it turned out that I hadn't changed clothes all week. <laughs> mother was not pleased. Another event from this time period that I remember was when I was in the second or third grade. I came home from school one day, and as young children will tend to do, I started talking back to mom, and it uttered a new phrase I had learned at school that day. Horrified, she grabbed my hand and pulled me into the bathroom and thoroughly washed out my mouth with soap. I can't remember if it was ivory or palm olive, but suffice it to say that phrase was effectively removed from my mouth and vocabulary. And considering our monthly theme, we see that chastening can alter behavior. When I was in the fourth grade, we moved to Independence to gather in. Our family was very active in the church, and mom found herself being the center stake women's leader. She was also on the World Church's Women's Council and enjoyed teaching at classes, at retreats, and the like. Also, mom loved music. She led the children's choir and taught piano lessons throughout her life. She had me in the children's choir where hopefully I was drowned out by the other children. And after two years of trying to teach me the piano, mom decided that I would never be a Mozart. I know that everyone here is aware of my musical skills or lack thereof. Mom always had a loving and kind nature. She passed shortly before her 91st birthday. Her last five years were spent in cognitive decline. Even as her memory faded, her love did not. She was always kind and never angry or confrontational. I believe that because Jesus was so deeply embedded in her soul that he always showed through. Toward the end, when she didn't recognize me and I had to tell her I was her son, I could tell that she knew it was someone but she just couldn't remember who they were. I would be amiss if I didn't talk about my mother-in-law, Vera Klein. The other day I heard a joke. It was, I've just returned from a very enjoyable trip. I took my mother-in-law to the airport. There is no way that that would apply to her. Mom, as I always called her, was a wonderful woman who loved Jesus and served him throughout her life. I have many memories of her as well. One that comes to mind is when in 2006, Cassie and I took mom with us and we went to Yellowstone. It was quite an adventure. We were in our pop-up camper. One night on the way, we had to close up the camper and go to a hotel due to a tornado warning. We were blessed in that we got the last hotel room in that small town. As an added bonus, we had a three-month-old puppy with us. Mom was very patient with the puppy. Yellowstone and the Tetons were beautiful. Sadly, we lost mom three years ago. Last but not least is the mother of our wonderful children, Cassie. I have been so blessed to have her as my companion for almost 41 years. It is because of her that our children have had the upbringing and knowledge of the gospel that they have 
I hate to think of what their religious education would have been if they had had to depend upon me alone. As you know, Cassie grew up in a home dedicated to the Lord much the same way that I did. Her father was the pastor of the local RLDS branch for many years, and her mother was always involved in the church as well. Cassie sacrificed when our children are young by being home as a full-time mother. Both of us wanted our children to have the benefit of her guidance and loving care. She has a deep devotion to Christ in his church. She has had a deep devotion to Christ in his church as long as I have known her. Fortunately, it was her musical abilities that our children inherited and not mine. Not only has our family been blessed, but all of you have through the hymn that the Lord inspired her to write, number 26, All Praise Be to Our Father. It has been my privilege to have had two wonderful women who exemplified godly mothers to me. Cassie and I were blessed to be with both our mothers when they peacefully passed to be with Christ in the Church of the Firstborn. We were sad to see them depart, but comforted by the gentle, reassuring spirit that was present when they, would, when they passed. I'd now like to loop back to our opening scripture, Psalm 3110. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Well, we're all familiar with that verse, but I would like to look at the nine verses that precede it. It is actually a mother providing counsel, or in this case, chastisement to her son, King Lemuel. Let's listen to what she had to say. The words of the King Lemuel, I'm sorry, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that who his mother taught him. What my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. Give not thy strength unto women, nor weigh thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgments of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto them that are ready to perish, and wine unto those a heavy heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his ministry no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all, as such are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. And then, who can find a virtuous woman, for her price is far above rubies? Sadly, I don't know that I can hardly ever remember reading those first nine verses. We've all read the part that continues on beyond that, of course. Today, we need godly mothers more than ever. If we are to combat the societal the breakdown that is occurring, we need strong families. Never has there been a greater need for Christian homes to witness to our communities the joy that comes from service to Christ. From the beginning of time, the nuclear family has been the foundation of stable societies. Today, we see that institution being attacked from every angle. Satan certainly is alive and well on planet Earth. He is attacking on so many different fronts, it is almost impossible to keep track of them. Christ calls us to witness and convert people to him in the cause of the kingdom. Few will ever go to foreign mission lands. Most of us witness to those around them. We need to remember that our actions speak louder than words. In 1 Corinthians, Paul said in 15 and 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are his at his comings. We have the assurance of inner peace in this life and the hope of a resurrection in the life to come. Pardon me. We are not promised ease now, but may be tried as if by fire. This month's theme is we endure the chastening that we might be partakers of holiness. I have very lightly touched on that theme today. 
I will leave it up to my brethren who are bringing the messages the rest of the month to expound upon it for us. Each of us live in a world of uncertainty and crisis. That uncertainty and crisis can either be personal or much broader in nature. We experience a personal crisis when we have devastating health, lose employment, or a loved one dies. As a society, we experience a crisis when we see the increasing crime and hate all around us. As a nation, we face economic turmoil, rabid hatred, the division of people into every conceivable category to war one against each other, and the threat of terrorist attacks, real attacks, not parents at school boards standing up for their right to raise their own children. A woke society that is sickly working overtime to destroy Christianity and all that it stands for. A society that has abandoned God and his promises. We have modern day revelations that prophesy these events would come. We live in a society where for many, sin doesn't exist, just personal choices. Prophets long ago said, repent ye, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People didn't listen then and they don't now, but we are still called to call people unto repentance. As individuals and as a society, we need to heed the price, I'm sorry, advice given in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. My personal testimony is that when I try to follow his commandments and submit myself to him, he has blessed my life and that of my family. I have not seen Christ nor had angelic visions. I have not heard him speak directly to me. I have felt the calm reassurance of his great love and he has spoken to my mind on occasion with that still small voice. And I do have the testimony that he lives today and sits on the right hand of God, our advocate before him on our behalf. In Handel's Messiah, I'm sorry, one of my favorite sections is the solo, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. This is a beautiful soprano solo. You know the words. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. I know that my Redeemer, for now is Christ risen from the dead, the first fruits of them that sleep. Just a few short days ago, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday and have the knowledge that we are redeemed from our sins by that sacrifice if we will but be obedient to his commandments and endure to the end. While we are yet alive, let us rejoice in Christ and testify of him that we may stand with him in the resurrection of the just. And today, may we honor our mothers and the memories of them as we put into practice what we have learned at their feet. God bless you on this joyous Mother's Day.
Heavenly Father, we would thank thee for the beautiful spirit that has rested upon us in the uh, hearing of the words that have been placed upon your, our brother's heart. We would ask that as we go throughout the day that we might remember our mothers, we might remember our wives, we might remember our children. They are the most important things that we have here on earth. As we have been taught by them, we have stood shoulder to shoulder with them, and then we have taught our children also. I would thank thee again for your blessings. Thank you for the place that we have to worship you and for the spirit that has been here. I would ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. 